Okay, let's kick off. So um, we are ACAN and we combine architecture and climate activism. Um, ACAN has got three aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. Now this event is being run by the Climate Literacy Group, which specifically focuses on the third aim, cultural transformation. We're calling for a complete remodeling of our industry's culture. We must challenge and redefine the values at the heart of our professional and educational system. And this event in particular is part of the practice action series that we're producing in collaboration with Architects Declare. This is a series of conversations and interactive masterclasses designed to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to um, transform towards more regenerative, sustainable and just practice models. It's really for those people that want to affect change. This event is one of a series of events. Um, there's already been an event hosted on the 6th of May by AD that I'm going to summarise briefly in a second. Um, and there's a whole host of events um, that are upcoming. And at the end of this talk, we'll give you a bit more information on the next two to come, understanding impact and transforming practice. So last time we had a, re um, we had a session on climate literacy. This was led by Mina Hasman. And it was structured all around the climate framework, which is a library that's been produced by the cross industry action group and designed with the REBA mandatory competencies in mind. It aims to provide consistency and collaboration across the built environment when we think about climate. And it's organized around six key themes. Um, it also acknowledges that everyone's at a different state stage in their progress through these they have different amounts of knowledge and skills um, in each of the topics and identifies different tiers and one of the things that we're going to be looking at today is the need to respect support and work together to share knowledge with everyone in order to tackle the crisis that we face part of the session that we held with ad was a series of interactive workshops by miro where we asked people to map both their high level and more detailed knowledge across these themes. So you can see here the plethora of sort of mapping that happened between skills and knowledge, where we are now and where we want to be in the future um, across these six broad themes. We then took a bit of a deep dive into energy and carbon and got people to think a bit more in detail about the topics, what they entailed, where they thought their knowledge fell for each of these topics, and then start to make a route to improve their knowledge um, and um, progress further. So if you attended the masterclass, we're gonna do a short poll. How did you leave the event feeling about climate literacy? Um, this poll should be coming up now. Hopefully Rebecca's going to post it. Um, and if you have any other thoughts about your next steps, you can pop those in the chat. Okay, great. We'll do some feedback on that poll in a second. So coming on to this event, this um, event is called Action Beyond Practice. Um, and it's going to be exploring themes of engaging, empowering and activating everyone's agency. And we're going to look at how to take action in your own practice and beyond. We've got three fantastic panellists. Rahila Khan Fitzgerald, who's an architect and whole life carbon and sustainability designer at Hawkins Brown. She spearheaded the HBERT tool, which many of you may know and have used, um, which is a tool that embeds into Revit to allow you to calculate whole life carbon emissions. She's a member of Letty and also a Reba journal Rising Star. Next, we have Becca Thomas. She's creative director and architect at New Practice. She delivers complex projects at a range of scales from pavilions and public realm to cultural and community buildings. She's a member of the Glasgow Urban Design Panel and a big part of her role is developing robust client briefs and also connecting people with the decision-making processes in the cities that they live in. And finally, we have Charlie Edmonds, a graduate of the University of Cambridge and a systems designer at Civic Square. He founded the Future Architects Front, a long-term ACAN collaborator, which explores the future of architectural labour organising and the both social and climate justice topics. This discussion is going to be facilitated by three ACAN members, Tom Matthews, Rosie Murphy and Vincent MacDonald. We're going to start with an opening question and introductions. Then each of the um, panel will post a poll which you can respond to and these will punctuate our discussion. Um, please all the way through this put your um, any questions that you have into the chat box um, and then we'll get to them with an audience Q&A at the end. 
Um, following all that, I'll give you a bit of a summary of the events that we've got up and coming. And then at the end, we'll stop the recording and we'll invite you to take part in an even more open discussion um, and allow you to become part of the conversation with us. So I'm going to stop sharing screen and wonder, I can now see that after the masterclass, amazing, lots of people are already on their way there and there are quite a few people ready and excited to start. I'm going to share the results now so you can see those. And now I'll hand over to the panel. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so really excited to uh, introduce our three panelists today. And as a way of kind of kicking stuff off, I'm going to um, invite each of the panelists to uh, answer an introductory question. And the question we're going to use is, um, do you feel that your voice is valued in your workplace? And is, um, did you take this agency yourself or was it created for you by your practice? So maybe if I ask Rahila to start and then we can move on to Charlie and then to Becca. Thank you, Tom. And, um... And thanks for having me here and thank you for the introduction, um, Rachel. So, yeah, it's it's just great to be able to talk about this in such an open format. And uh, I think just I'll start with something positive that, yes, I definitely feel that my voice is valued in the workplace, but it wasn't necessarily always the case. Um, so I am a, only a recently qualified architect. I qualified in September and I think that journey to becoming an architect was quite important. Um, for me to feel more confident um, and um, to have that voice valued more, not only just in the workplace, but beyond, you know, with clients um, and collaborators. So <clears throat> it was a journey that probably has taken, say, three to four years um, where I've built up confidence and, um, and that has definitely been helped by the support I've had in the practice. So really good mentorship um, and recognition for the work that I have done with HBIT. But the, my, the practice I work for also gave me the platform to do that research in-house. So it's, um, it's been both action on my side and, um, and the kind of the opportunity to, to take that forward. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's probably been because of continuing um, with with the uh, with action and continuing to sort of try and push the agenda and not giving up um <laughs> it's it's sort of been a a process where i've when i felt very frustrated with architectural work which i'm sure many of us um agree that we we have that at times in our career i've used um uh, sort of climate action and a uh, sustainable agenda to try and push through that and that is now being recognized more and more I think not just in in my practice but in the industry as a whole. Amazing Charlie what about you? Yeah so I think it's uh, probably a little bit of a similar answer in a sense that um, I think I'm in a very privileged and lucky position right now where I do feel like my voice is uh, being listened to um, I yeah like like was said earlier I currently work at Civic Square and climate equity are sort of cornerstones of the entire reason the group exists so uh yeah like I said I feel very lucky to be in a place where I it's very easy for me to um align myself with these things in a workplace um and I suppose uh similar to a lot of the work of faf it's kind of a similar approach in the sense that uh in order to try and work architecturally the way that i wanted i had to sort of leave architecture as a traditionally understood profession um so yeah it's it's a uh, an interesting kind of um sort of another route around to the place that I wanted to be in terms of the work I'm doing but um yeah currently feeling very lucky in the situations I'm in cool Becca I mean yes but I also think it would be weird if I didn't feel agency in a practice that I founded so that would be a very weird situation to find myself in um so I guess there's a bit of a different uh setup and a lot of um I guess interestingly for me is having over the past decade been able to build to places where I feel I have agency with our clients or with the people that we're working with so that we can um, push forward ideas you know about kind of sustainability both 
environmental, as I'm sure we'll discuss in great detail tonight, but also socially and culturally, um, those kind of pushing those ideas um, and speaking to clients and speaking to collaborators and making sure that those are ideas that are strongly kind of held at the core of our project. So um, for me, that's been about not necessarily in my office and my studio, but just spreading that um, kind of further into the into the wider workplace um, or the, the groups that we're working with. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you set up a practice at 23, there's, 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 there's always going to be ways of kind of making, you have to make an agency for yourself doing it that way. So uh, yeah, thanks. Cool. So I think we're going to move on to our first audience poll, um, which is going to be Rahila's poll. So Rahila, I'll hand over to you to introduce that. Thank you. And so, um, yeah, the first poll is a reflectance on what I probably uh, just mentioned. It's about mentorship. And I um, uh, have had well, been quite lucky, I feel, with with quite strong mentorship. And so the first poll question is, how important is mentorship as a tool to support self-directed action and agency? Um, so to follow that, if you are able to answer in the chat as well, um, what can what can we do to mentor and encourage each other more? It seems like there's a bit of a 50-50 split at the moment. <laughs> it's quite interesting to see. Hila, how are you finding the split that's currently going on? Is it what you expected? No, um, I so yeah, the, the split seemed to be kind of between being mentored and founding that it was supportive and not being mentored at all. Um, so I was not expecting uh, as many people to have not been mentored. Um, so I think there's definitely work probably we all need to do here uh, in order to to mentor and I don't think mentorship is necessarily a hierarchical thing it's it's about you know peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and not just within the practice but outside but you know across the whole industry um and maybe not even within architecture itself the whole construction industry and beyond uh, to getting you know creative industries as as well as um working with contractors and um yeah at events such as ACAN and um and ways that we can try and bring in creative mentorship as well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few people who have been ment mentored and haven't found it very helpful. Um, so that's sort of good to see <laughs> that, um, that that's a quite a low percentage. Rahila, in terms of your experience of mentoring, do you think, and I guess touching on what you were just saying there, that if in practices there's a more of a structure of mentorship, it it means that it happens more often. I mean, in my experience, there isn't uh, such a structure. So it's been lucky for me to find particular people that are have time to mentor me. But I can imagine if that was a different scenario, it would be really difficult as there isn't that structure in place. Yeah, definitely. So I, um, again, I, I have been quite lucky in that there was a formal mentoring structure that was put in place when I joined. But uh, ironically, that wasn't the mentorship that I, I found really useful. So that, that more formalized mentorship structure um, didn't necessarily work for me. And it was actually through joint interest that I found my mentor and, uh, and how I now mentor, mentor as well. Um, yeah, Becca seems to have a finger up. I was gonna say, I think it's really interesting because obviously large practices I do think those formal structures tend to exist and they should exist that's an, they, if they don't exist I think it can be really difficult to find your person in a, in a large practice and I have having predominantly worked on much smaller practices and running a small practice I find those formal structures can feel a bit fake or a bit kind of enforced um and so maybe there's there are different ways of mentorship existing and I do think that idea really you brought up of the whole creative industries having a having a mentorship um kind of effort between ourselves between people in the built environment um i think that's maybe um, could be really really powerful if we can if you can find the right people but that does put a lot on the person who wants mentorship to find the people to mentor them rather than allowing that to be kind of given down from 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 you know um structures that, that exist around them Thanks everyone for your answers. Um, I'm just going to jump in with an additional thought. So hello everyone, I'm Rosie from ACAN. Um, 
On the topic of mentorship, um, specifically with regards to climate action in practice, and um, because mentoring can um, sort of aid a number of personal and professional issues without throughout practice. Um, but I wonder if you can speak maybe to an experience that I've just sort of observed anecdotally, where lots of young graduates are leaving architecture school with um, really high intentions for climate activism or sustainability with sustainability knowledge, but then they end up going into practice and are almost um, hired because of what knowledge they've gained in university, which means that they then become the experts in their office. So there's this sort of experience where if you're um, a sustainability, you're the sustainability expert, you don't have the benefit that sort of anyone else has in the practice to learn from others and take the time to develop and grow um, at sort of uh, the traditional pace um, because everyone above you sort of learns the same thing. Um, so yeah, I wonder if you could speak maybe to some of the people who might be in practice in, in um, those roles, but yeah, might feel isolated. I'm happy to go first um so yeah i i think i probably did, yeah have felt that myself and in that with the hbird tool embodied carbon wasn't necessarily something that the practice knew much about um so just as a quick background the hbird tool is not of my invention at all this was something that hawkins brown had collaborated with um, ucl on a research project and one of the outputs of that um with uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz was HBIRT uh, in its first sort of iteration. And I joined just when um, that was becoming a tool. So I was sort of just right moment, right time, and very passionate about um, wanting to be involved. Uh, that, that got me that experience. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that I did anything to get me there in the first place, but once I was there, I sort of hung on with, with them tooth and nail. And um, and and then took it from there so really spearheaded uh, continuing that research once it once it had stopped but that that did mean that i was the person who probably uh, was was trying to find out more and research more and and then people came too even though i i was a very um young and inexperienced at the time so there's a lot of pressure to then feel like you have the answers when all you all you're really doing is is trying to um, find out the answers yourself um, but that what really helped me was actually having a really supportive team that contributed to that. So we were all together within it. And there wasn't that hierarchy of, you know, the, the you should go to this person because they're senior, but actually getting everyone's opinion and voice heard, um, because this is something we're all learning. And that um, also coincided with this, what I felt was the starting of um, the main kind of industry working groups and through industry working groups that feeds back into practice. Um, and, and I would say in terms of finding mentors, mentors that um, perhaps you may feel you lack within the practice industry working groups have been incredible for that um, and finding sort of the people who have maybe been working at this for a lot longer than we have but um, that it's it's uh, their voices aren't heard as much uh, perhaps because they you know they may not be part of zoom um, kind of panel shows and stuff uh, but yeah I'm not sure if that answered your question or not We did have a sort of follow up question um, because I think you also mentioned Rahila and I wonder if Charlie and Becca have experienced this um, about what was better about the mentorship that you received outside of practice and how did that contribute or help with your role in practice in sustainability? I'm happy to jump in on that one. The, um, the I think what's been really nice, I guess mentorship in my practice for me is sorry about this baby, um, is is uh, is really like between me and Mark. So it's kind of just the two of us kind of talking and trying to learn together. Um, so for both of us, finding people outside our practice has been really important. And those people tend to come from a range of um, backgrounds. We have other architects and uh, but also um, engineers and people who work in completely other industries um, and actually that's been I found those to be really um, insightful in just when you're kind of explaining the complexities of the built environment or business within the built environment and sustainability and how you 
um, factor that in, they've been able to come with completely different solutions that may be very relevant to their industry, but things that you can kind of learn from and 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 take what works when you kind of you know not everything from um, factory production will be val will be re valid and relevant when you consider it in an architectural um, kind of product line it's a very different space but um it's good to kind of get that completely different perspective i think and try and use that as a kicking point to to actually understand and and synthesize it for yourself so that you can kind of learn that lesson rather than someone handing you a finished package of of solutions and i think that for me has been the best thing about um outside mentorship yeah i would uh <clears throat> i would um in terms of the outside sort of mentorship i think that's been really big for me mostly because um i think when especially the architects and designers talk about climate it i, I always think it tends to veer very heavily towards the sort of technocratic um like this idea that as long as we can highlight a solution, we will have a solution. Whereas obviously um, there's far more uh, entrenched sort of power systems at play that prevent that from happening. So the thing that um, has been really sort of, I guess, empowering for me in terms of how I engage in uh, work related to climate action is um, sort of, I, I I wouldn't normally describe it as mentorship just because it feels more um, sort of decentralized than that rather than like a direct relationship. But like the, the, the insight I've been able to get from like labor movements, from um, people working outside of traditional business structures. So like in, um, you know, like even learning how like at Civic Square it's run as a CIC rather than a, LLC or a limited company, for example, all of these things have been, uh, like I said, very empowering in sort of, I guess, understanding your position in the larger mechanisms that produce the climate destruction that we're seeing everywhere, um, and understanding how you can then better leverage the position that you're in, um, and kind of, you know, collectively leverage position with other people as well um and all of that i think has come from groups that are very much outside of the sort of typical architectural discourse that um we've kind of been sitting in for um however many years now we've got a, a question in the chat and i don't know if any of those experiences charlie might be able to be summed up in this way but talene's asking um if there are any um for those speakers that were mentored what was the most useful advice assistance that you were you were given i don't know if anyone's got any particular things that jump out maybe hard to uh, think of one thing i mean it's hard to it's hard to boil them down without sounding very pithy i but i mean i guess the biggest thing from all of kind of from all of the mentors that I've had over the years all of them are kind of very much in the keep learning keep reading keep doing things and I think those are those are the most important lessons regardless of you know each one of them has solutions or has things that they want to share with you specifically but actually I think that that is the takeaway from all of it is that if we I guess if we stop trying to learn during our careers then we've kind of got into the ruts that we we, ne we definitely need to get out of um I'll let Rahila, if you go next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. I think it's that support that like someone has your back and they believe in you and um, they're encouraging you to, to just continue and go for it because you will have the times when you're absolutely exhausted or you're being like bow beaten by a client or a project or even in, internally the, the dynamics aren't working in practice. And just to have that, that little light that 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 push back um to get you to get you to where you you were heading um and yeah i think in terms of the the 
the previous question about um, what was better about the mentorship outside practice, it's perhaps for me, it was about having that like-minded community. So even in the conversation we're having now, we it, it feels comfy, you know, it feels like you're not here in a kind of pigeonholed role. Um, it's much more relaxed and, and informal sort of social and that's really empowering. Thank you. I was just going to um, um, sort of follow up with, I think one thing that Charlie raised earlier and I think speaks to what, um, uh, the, sort of the process of mentoring that you're um, alluding to, where mentorship, as far as I see it, and as, as far as um, I think part of the cultural transformation that we're talking about in ACAN, is that it doesn't stand as a hierarchical um, structure with somebody sort of with the knowledge, passing on knowledge to someone who is a sort of empty recept reciprocal waiting to get the knowledge, um, that it is actually this like mutually beneficial learning process. Um, and I think, yeah, in terms of what we've been suggesting about that pressure of feeling of thinking that you need to be some sort of expert or know what you're talking about in sustainability. And Rahili, you mentioned that there's this understanding that you're all learning um, and that it is a continual process. Um, and I think that that's the essence of mentorship. And just another thing that I think that there's a difference between knowledge that we get from sort of the people around us informally and a defined mentor mentee relationship and to be and to enter into that um, relationship like consciously it means you have to um, agree to certain terms and um, agreements um, which you don't necessarily do if it's sort of the informal setting um, like we're having the discussion today and then it just means that being an excellent practitioner or a wonderful designer or an expert in sustainability doesn't necessarily equate to being a good mentor um, and how these are skills that are very much learned and developed over time. If I could just uh, jump in with a, a, a quick question, um, just sort of to, to, uh, to everyone really. Um, well, I'll, I'll quickly mention as well that we've been uh, we've been collecting a lot of questions before the event. Uh, Charlie was helping uh, through the Future Architects front pages. Um, we set out quite a few questions on the Instagram page, uh, which some of you might have seen. So if you have seen them, uh, yeah, let us know in the chat that you got involved in those. Um, I think there's a sort of one one of those questions that really fits in in now, which was about does your practice encourage everyone at all levels to share their experience and their insights? And uh, mentorship was one of the ones that kept coming up. Um, but there's also um, uh, a couple of points about anonymity and not being um, sort of uh, uh, sort of having these conversations away from directors and away from people in positions of power. Um, and I think sort of the question the question that I'm sort of leading to is: Have you sort of got any advice for for young starters and Young people coming into practices about having the confidence to speak to their directors and, and not feeling overwhelmed um, so that you can have that two-way dialogue that I think is is what we're sort of getting to which is about the mentorship which goes both ways and that a lot of young people have got ideas and they're, they're willing to share but um, but uh, might not have the confidence to go and speak to their directors and, and get get that urgency and sense of urgency across. Uh, Becca. Yeah, I mean, as a person running a practice, I love this when this happens because it means that people have got together and have something they really strongly care about. And that then is something that they can, we can then support them to develop. Um, we spend a lot of time kind of working with our team to try and figure out what we all need to learn or what we all need to do. And as a small team, that's kind of handleable. You can have these conversations on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but I, I think it is... I mean, generally what the answer is, is I've been too busy and I haven't thought about this, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> could, what, do you have any ideas of where we could access that information? And then, you know, you kind of keep keep going on that conversation. So I do think uh, most of the practice directors I know would feel kind of similarly to that in that, yes, 
this is great. We also want this and I don't know where to get that information or I haven't had time to research that properly. Do you? I can give you Friday afternoon. Go away, think about it and come back with an idea. I think that is um, that is something that I, I, uh, I, I do really think is, um, yeah, if you can and you, you, you have someone that you think you could speak to like that, um, most practices that I know would be really like I don't think that should be something that you should be worried about or think someone's going to judge you for doing that I do think it should be um yeah it, it should be something that you can do and should do and it doesn't have to be you know an associate or a even your direct architect that you report to I think that can be a really helpful way of just helping escalate it up if you're in a really top-down structure of a practice um but yeah that's my 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 thoughts I'm gonna calm this one <laughs> Really? Yeah, that just reminded me that um, maybe not like uh, in terms of mentorship, but one of um, the more important moments in my earlier career was a uh, someone, I guess, like hierarchically above me asking me when I asked a question. So what should I do about X? Uh, they just fed that back to me and said, what do you think you should do about X? And that was quite an important moment to go oh right I right I can say something I can do I can actually think about this and I, I have the agency and I that was a really important learning curve to to remember that we are a team like whatever we do within this industry we are we are a team and um and it's finding your voice within that and um, and yeah I really respect that um that senior person at the time for giving me that lesson John yeah, um, I would, yeah, obviously, uh, repeat everything that's been said. Um, I guess the only thing that I would like expand on from the question itself is just, you know, that there are also other options. Um, you know, it's not fully in the hands of whoever your director or boss is to, to make these decisions. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, unless you're at a really, really micro practice, there's more of you than there are of them. So you can always, um, you know, make sure that you're not just talking to the person above you about it, but you're also talking to each other about it, making sure that um, everyone is sort of on the same page, make sure that everyone has access to the same information. And then that way, it's not just down to you as an individual to speak for this. It's something that can be more um, collectively uh pushed for um and i think that across the board um we'd probably see a lot more success stories if um i think things were organized more often in that way rather than it being down to the the individual who happens to have you know the the knowledge and resources to to raise um climate in a sort of in in a workplace and like you know this goes beyond architecture this this counts for any workplace at the end of the day um this this is just uh i think generally a good strategy anytime you're trying to sort of implement a change that is um something that you know you need someone in the position of higher power to sort of like provide support for like don't make it all reliant on them get get as many people along with you as you can and I think that's incumbent on those of us who do have power to make it easy to, for people to come with ideas or create um, space for that really simply. So like we just have a, a Slack channel for learning and people can drop ideas into that at any point so that it's not about having to come to one of us directly and say, I have an idea, I need a thing, I need this to be you know formal. It's just about saying, you know, I have an idea today and it's Tuesday lunchtime and I'm going to forget about it because now I've got a million things to do before the end of the day, but it's just there so you can share things. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think it's, I mean, it's a very simple thing, but ask questions, even if they seem silly, get your voice heard, you know, and, and get those, yeah, I guess get your kind of, how do I put it? Like start to sort of hear yourself speak out loud um, to give you the confidence to continue to do that. And um, and also find the thing that you are interested in to push forward with, because 
a someone who is meant who's managing you will of course want to use your resources and what you're interested in will will come through and shine through so if you can try and find the thing that you you're wanting to push forward on you'll probably find that you will do more and more of those tasks and um, because that's what you you know you're you're bringing um your shine to and um and then and through that hopefully it's sort of baby steps that you develop and, and continue to to like to, to showcase um through action and um and then you're able to get more credibility i think because it's not just can i please do this and can i get this half day to do that but they try and explain what is the benefit of you doing that and um, what are the outcomes because i think most people will want to support you um and it's it's sort of taking them on that journey um towards getting there yeah i i agree i think in, in my experience i felt that there wasn't many conversations around climate happening in my practice so i felt that was adding to my sense of uh kind of a lack of confidence about raising it but um, when i found a way into some conversations about showing I had some interest I then was aware that there was actually lots of conversations going on I just maybe because of the projects I was working at and the stage I was working at I wasn't um being able to access them and actually finding those that way in it really helps to build um build up and you get more access and that kind of thing um yeah so I think we'll maybe move on to our next audience poll question which is from Becca so Becca I'll hold, hand over to you <laughs> hi so um, I guess picking up on some of the things we've been talking about, um, this poll question is, do you feel you are given or supported to take agency to guide ideas and concepts within projects um, that would support what you see as better outcomes? So are you, can you find ways to, to introduce these ideas, particularly around sustainability into projects? And, and are there barriers to that? Um, so, sure. I feel like this might be a good point to bring in uh, one of our other Instagram posts that we had on the Future Architects page, um, Future Architects front page, uh, which was, uh, have you ever tried to bring forward sustainable suggestions at work? Uh, if not, what have been the barriers? So uh, along similar themes um, and uh, yeah, similarly like the like the poll, it was, it's, it's about client's perception, cost, um, the, the knowledge and the skills, um, but also with directors assuming that clients might have other priorities um and uh, and assumptions that clients might not want to pay or that there's this perceived more expensive um branding that, that comes with sustainability um i was wondering becca are the poll poll answers what you expected as well um similar question yeah. to what he was earlier i think perhaps i'm 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 excited to see that about a third of responders are supported to do this which i'm, I'm really happy to see this you know, you hear some horror stories. Um, but I think it's interesting that the barriers are then split between, you know, clients and then colleagues or directors or kind of management of practices. I think that's that feels to me like um that that worry that um yeah, that either directors have a worry that clients will be a barrier and not allowing the client to make that decision, or indeed that we do have quite a lot of clients, and this will range widely depending on your practice, but you have quite a lot of clients who are terrified of of sustainability as a as a topic either because they don't know anything or because they think it's expensive or you know whatever the reason i think that's that's perhaps what's coming through in that poll um as somewhat as i expected which i think is yeah it's quite interesting um i say we we work a lot with lay clients and um communities and i think that is their their lack of understanding is a huge huge problem um for them because they don't know what they want to instruct um, and there's, you know, you can take them along a journey and do kind of learning and, and knowledge sharing, but um, there will always be things that will be too terrifying or impossible to fund because the funders won't won't touch them. So um, I think those would be interesting, uh, maybe interesting things to pick up a bit more um, as we discuss it. But yeah, some poll is jumping around on my screen. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on it. I feel as though with, with our practice and, and where I work, um, when it comes to projects, one of the, the barriers that I find is, is my technical knowledge. But I, I, again, let's sort of come back to that point that we were talking about before, which is it's not just a technolo technological question. It's, it's that 
complete cultural transformation is is, is what we're looking for and uh, like it's the, that, that key aim of ACAN and it's it's sort of trying to get across that it's it's, it's both to do with the projects but it is it's about communication it's about getting getting the message across that it's it's, it's urgent and it needs needs to happen now um and I, I guess with such, such a wide range of clients um that, that we have um, that we're working with um it, it's, it seems to happen it's definitely easier with, with private clients um to be able to to, to talk one-to-one -one where where it's like a big development corporation there's never really that that sort of same same empathy and um same way of communicating so uh, yeah i'll pass over to Rahila. thanks vincent yeah i agree it's but i guess from my experience it's trying to find who to speak to so trying to find that person who may be able to to listen a bit more or who has this the skills and knowledge that um you, you is probably one of the main barriers that we're facing um so within a client body there's probably going to be many heads and and uh, yeah, one of the first tasks is like trying to find the, the kind of common ground or a person who or people who might be able to take on what you're saying a bit more openly. Um, but perhaps one thing I've learned is to really use our skills, like especially visual skills, presentations uh, to, to, to really sell the sustainability and, you know, not just to do with like carbon, but also well-being and um, ecology and and yeah, try and get ways to make it sexy you know do our job and then um the, what we do with design but bringing it it to other other parts of of the project and making them um you know a, a priority and as important um so one other thing that i found is although it may not be in our scope but it's it's important to challenge briefs from really early on and to but not in an aggressive way in a very gentle um uh and and supportive way and and what's been really encouraging and in, in even the last year is that i think clients are becoming a bit more climate literate and they are definitely starting to focus more on on more sustainable aspirations and so it's like it's it's really taking that and uh, and being encouraged by it and, and building upon it to start off with it may be that you know it falls away to cost or um other other barriers planning for example or um, you know supply chain issues but it could be that at least something sticks so yeah kind of building it up from from that from one particular point i think it might be a good moment to bring in uh one quote that we've had from uh sabrina syed who's um one of the writers at the the um uh architecture Fan, um foundation um she uh yeah got in contact with us uh and sent a couple of uh a couple of quotes across um and uh i'll just read it out now so she, she said that she's experienced the climate and ecological discourse uh intensely uh in in, in my editorial career across the board young writers and researchers care as much as those at the top but when it comes to architectural practice it feels like a crisis becomes sustainability which transforms into a niche topic in many offices that only a select few are invited to participate in. It gets worth, worse when offices are very hierarchical because younger employees aren't invited in when it can be argued we feel it the most existentially. Uh, what advice do you have for young architects that are struggling to make meaningful contributions in the workplace when the doors are barely open for us? Um, so, so slightly similar question before Charlie. Um, but I was wondering whether you had any, any, any further thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it goes back to the things we were talking about earlier about the necessity to um, organize, like, you know, horizontally, like find solidarity with people um, who are in similar positions to you. Um, I have been sort of saying for a little while now that I think that the sort of ever gaining momentum labor movement that we're seeing around the world right now is inex inextricably tied to the climate movement because um at the end of the day you know if the built environment is dictated through private clients which in the uk about 99 percent of it is um then the built environment is going to be dictated by the interests of uh overwhelmingly the interests of profit capital investment 
and that right now flies in the face of um, the way that we need to be engaging with the built environment around climate. So you come up against this problem where design practice alone is wholly insufficient to uh, engage with the scale of the problem, um, which, you know, there's a, a really good piece in failed architecture called all design is political, not all politics is design. And uh, I agree with the sort of argument in that piece, which essentially says that we need to recognize the limits of design practice and not be scared to go beyond that and actually start to uh, operate as sort of people with political agency who can, um, you know, try and implement these changes at a more fundamental structural societal level. Um, because that's the sort of, that's the, that's the level of ambition that we need. Um, and then that, you know, essentially changes the container for how the built environment is allowed to be shaped for how architects are allowed to work. Um, so, you know, in, in, in my view, I think organizing as workers, organizing the way that ACAN are organizing, this is the way to sort of like set our sights at the right sort of level of ambition of change um, so that we can, like I said, uh, change the container that tells the profession how it's allowed to operate. Yeah, I mean, I Charlie, a lot of those points, I feel like maybe architecture is having a kind of political moment. It's felt for a really long time like architects have been apolitical, and that is perhaps to the detriment of um, what we think we should be doing. Um, if, we're, if we're apolitical, then we're not making bold statements on socially or culturally or environmentally. We're, we're just not having a voice there and kind of working as tools of, of kind of, as you say, capitalism and, and infrastructure um, kind of building, which is, is maybe not a, what a lot of us thought we were doing uh, for a really long time. Um, and that is, I think this is really interesting to see um, the labor movement come to architecture. And I think that feels quite late. Um, and it certainly wasn't something that that existed when I was even when I was a part one, which, which wasn't that long ago. So um, for me, that feels like a, a tipping point in terms of having a really a really powerful voice against, you know, and not putting sustainability or environmental concerns into a into a corner. But that being something like, you know, if, if architects, we refuse to demolish things, we, we will do retrofit, I think, as a, as a bold statement, I think starts to at least move the discussion you know, around a bit of a corner that it's been stuck on for, for a while, which is, you know, um, and then again, I do think the, the balances of building practice, building businesses, uh, and and what we think we should be doing, the political goals or the, the social goals of architecture, I think that there was, there was a big tension there. And that is something that, that is difficult to resolve. Um, and it takes quite a lot of will to make sure that that is not, one doesn't get subsumed by the other, um, which, yeah. I don't, I don't have an end thought to that. It's just, it just is. Um. If I may, I just wanted to pick up on uh, the question as well, which is, was specifically to like um, graduates entering the profession or um, young people or even any age um, changing careers or moving jobs um, and how their voices might be heard as sort of new starters into a, into a practice. Um, but I'd also sort of take that question and move like one step forward as um, applicants to specific roles as well. And when you're applying for jobs, this can often feel like a time of powerlessness um, where sort of the, the feeling is that you're sort of at the mercy of, of the employers and whoever's doing the hiring. Um, but I'd, I've sort of had the idea for a while about the potential power that, that lies in applicants. And if we were to shift um, the sort of, the idea that you want to apply for the biggest or most world renowned practices um, or rather shift uh, the emphasis to practices which display like really amazing sustainability credentials and what would happen if they became the like extremely sought after roles and and so they the employers begin to see a, a flux and um change in in who's applying to those roles um yeah becca 
I was going to say, perhaps some of that is already starting with the growth in employee owned practices and them being very popular places to work for, certainly around around where, where I am in, in Scotland. Um, they seem to be the practices that are getting loads of applicants and kind of moving. So I do think that I think there is there is such power in who people will apply to, you know, um, and, and, and who is applying where um, if, if the only applicants you get are not applicants that you see in your practice then you're, you're doing something wrong in the way that you're presenting yourself because the the, the pool that you get kind of reflects back at you and um, how you how you are seen so i think that's something that maybe um yeah people hiring um directors practice managers could could learn from is looking at that pool and seeing whether they think they're being successful in in what they're putting out there because that is um yeah a reflection that may or may not be positive <laughs> depending on where you are yeah i think um uh kind of moving on from that uh and i think the experience of myself as a, a recent part one graduate and lots of my peers is that we came out of university feeling really uh, engaged in our social environmental ideas but then just because of the way that industry is a lot of us um ended up working for practices that didn't have the same kind of environmental aspirations so <clears throat> I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on how, as a kind of part one or part two, you can um, still work for um, a practice where you can find a job because that's often the way it goes, but still feel that you you keep your values um, and feel, I guess, your, I guess, going back to that idea of where your political power is and that actually you still have um, the like possibility of finding other places to gain uh, motivation and and uh, I guess like further these ideas that it wasn't so much a question but um, if anyone has any thoughts yeah, um, yeah if I can jump in I think it maybe it's going back to Charlie's point earlier about finding like-minded people within the practice they exist but it's hard to to kind of get together and Something I found, um, which was very much encouraged at the practice I work for, but um, was was sort of more kind of grassroots, perhaps bottom up approach, was to to create more working groups or like, um, yeah, kind of uh, like minded groups that again showcased um, or maybe was a platform to be able to talk more honestly about something and then brought that in a in a collective way to the front. Um, because I'm sure there are many people who will have similar values um, to yours, even if you feel that as a practice, it, it, it does not. And then, um, and yeah, pitching in that way to, to kind of try and, and move the conversation around. Um, but it is really encouraging to see how many more practices are becoming um, employee owned or um, having looking at practice in a different light um, to, to be able to bring more a more rounded kind of voice to the front so it's not just about you know the, the people in power the, par the partners and directors um but also maybe keeping in touch with the, the your um sort of the people of the same level as you or people you went to university with your contacts or uh, maybe someone you met during your university years like your peers and um and seeing how things are done in other practices having again that network outside um to encourage you to to continue uh sort of yeah keep keeping your values within within your practice um and always know that you you have a choice and you don't always have to stay within the kind of even doing part one, part two, part three, uh, I, th I think you can always relook at that journey. And we, we're a lot of the time on this treadmill and we don't really stop and, and consider different routes. And it, it, it's really inspiring to see what Becca's done, for example, you know, stop your own practice. Yeah. <laughs> on the topic of working groups and uh, getting together with your peers, we've got a question from the chat, which is speaking of the labor movement, coming to architecture, do you have any reflections on the latest failed push for architect, uh, American architects to unionize? Do you think this will come to the UK slash does it need to? Um, got, got a nodding Charlie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, yeah, so if, if anyone doesn't know, basically um, a group called Shop Architects in the, uh, New York uh, were the first sort of 
um, practice to push significantly for unionization um, for about 80 years, uh, I believe. So it was a real immense uh, sort of shift in the culture um, for this to have happened, um, even in the first place. Uh, we saw that a lot of uh, Im immediate union busting from the uh, the directors um, resulted from that. Um, and they ended up uh, losing the vote to unionize after um, this, the, the sort of intimidation tactics were sadly effective. But I don't necessarily see it as a resounding defeat because that movement has sparked six other offices, uh, I believe, in New York to begin their own process of unionization. Um, and if we look beyond the boundaries of architecture, we can see um, huge, huge rapid process in like some of the biggest companies in the world in terms of unionization. So loads and loads of Starbucks in the US have started to become unionized. Amazon has started to become unionized. Um, and the people leading these groups have risen to sort of, you know, atmospheric levels of, um, influence and um you know their collective groups have kind of sprung up almost overnight so it does feel like we're on the precipice of um or even in the midst of uh, a sort of rapid surge of labor movements um and we haven't even really quite appreciated it yet because it's still so early on in the process um but yeah i definitely wouldn't see the uh, the result of the shop uh, effort to unionize as um, a defeat in any means, because uh, like I said, that drive more generally is still going very strong. You've got UVW saw in the UK, which continues to grow every year. Um, and the group who did uh, start the unionization drive, uh, the uh, AWU, they uh, are still organizing. They're still, um, you know, doing a lot of amazing work on this front. Um, and I am very, very confident that it's certainly not the last we've heard from them. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting insight into how this type of movement will be received in a lot of situations, but I don't think it's an indication of what the end result will be. Um, I had a thought and it's completely gone out of my head. Um, I'm going to think about it for a second. Rahila, do you have any, any thoughts? Sorry, took a second there to unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think what, what Charlie has um, sort of expressed that it's w within, I think any effort is, is not a wasted effort. And, um, and I guess we are quite, uh, privileged here in the UK that we have got um, like Seoul, for example, um, and that has, you know, really gained traction over the last year, um, and that we're able to to really discuss uh, unionization and, and through um, efforts such as Future Architects Front, you know, get the voices of people who are normally not heard, heard, um, and in a, in a quite a sort of a relatively safe environment where you don't feel as though there's going to be a huge backlash from from um, speaking up. So um, yeah, I think it's more just to, 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 keep, to say, to keep on going, to encourage um, uh, more and more platforms such as ACAN and, and Future Architects Front. And, and yeah, if you're interested in joining the union, to join the union. <laughs> and I would also say, I think that even, even without, uh, even kind of out with formal labor movements or formal unionization, I think, using the tools that you have available. Like I know Reba's um, scale, pay scale, but it, it's, it's retroactive. It's not the best tool, but it's there. I think being able to use those and point to them when you're having discussions and, and making a case for being paid appropriately and, and kind of fighting within those spaces if, if, that, if that isn't being kind of given to you and organized from, from above, using, using what is already there to make the case and, and push for it because it's really, really important. I do think, I mean, that as a, as a profession, we are terrible. I think we're kind of coming to the end of seeing internships where people are working for free, I hope. Um, but 
I mean, that they, they aren't roundly um, shouted down by the people who should represent us um, is, is is astounding, and it always has been to me. Um, so I think those are, you know, what what we what we um, I would just push for anyone who is in a position where they are taking jobs or accepting roles to to fight to be paid for what they think they are worth, not just what is, you know someone is willing to pay you because it will always be lower than what you think you are worth. Um, except in a very few examples so yeah um, and it's not always easy but to have those conversations with with the tools that exist maybe a good point to jump onto our next poll which is charlie so i'll hand over to charlie oh you're gonna have to send me uh where my thing is stored tom i've i've completely uh lost all my google google tabs that's no worries i'll just send you it just now before then um Rahila's uh, I believe has got to head off now um but I think everyone here has, has, has had a wonderful discussion uh, so far um and uh, yeah we'll continue for the next 15 minutes or so um but yeah thank you very much Rahila for, for joining um and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll speak soon thank you so much for having me and yeah I look forward to uh, seeing the outcome of, of some of these chats <laughs> thanks everyone thank you bye Great, thanks, Tom. That's uh, that's what I get for having uh, like thirty tabs open all at once. So, the question is: uh, Do you consider climate literacy in action alongside inclusion, labour, and equity? Do you see these as linked topics or unrelated? We have another quote from Sabrina. Um, the uh, the, uh, the quote is that uh, one of the reasons I left the UK to return to Switzerland is issues of pay in the UK uh, architecture industry. While London has similar costs of living to here, our pay is exponentially higher. In Swiss entry roles, we've got stricter labour laws to protect us from exploitation. So it is still present. I feel that since entering architecture school 10 years ago, I've less and less to offer in a traditional assistant qualification track because it's simply got more and more difficult to survive on those salaries and that career progression. I'd like to hear the panels, especially FAF thoughts on how entry level jobs options for young architects are transforming for better or worse. Yeah, um, how the entry level jobs are transforming. Um, I mean, they've been on a pretty bad trajectory. Um, if you look at the way the salaries for part ones have changed over uh, preceding decades. If you adjust for inflation, they've fell um, fairly significantly. Um, I we, we regularly get messages from people who say something like, I remember joining an architecture practice in the 80s and I got paid 20,000 a year. And it's like, oh, wow. And that was in that was in 80s pounds. So that's worrying. Um, so in, in, in real terms, it's been, um, getting progressively worse in terms of the, uh, you know, quality of life that you can ascertain from the salary that you're being paid. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily fair to lay that blame at the door of architecture as a profession alone. Um, I think obviously that is linked to wider sort of neoliberal um, governance that has, uh, you know, seen uh, wages fall across the board. Um, so it's 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 something again that where we have to sort of look at the you know harsh reality that uh, we 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 do not operate in a bubble and we do in fact depend on larger economic factors and um, that has uh yeah had a sort of pretty negative effect on um the quality of life of entry-level architectural workers um i think we're in a the, i think the way that the situation is unique is that um architects are uniquely placed to have suffered from the sort of neoliberal process in the sense that 
in the 70s, about half of all architectural work was publicly funded, whereas now it's less than 1%. So, you know, architecture is uniquely placed to not do well from this, this larger process that we've been going through. Um, but, you know, that's the sort of situation that we find ourselves in. And, um, you know, we now have to sort of uh, ask ourselves, do we do we continue this death spiral? Do we continue to undercut one another and buy into the uh, market-led rationale of the world? Or do we uh, try and do something else? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you've just said, Charlie. Um, and, and I also think that within the profession, there are a couple of key points we can look at that have helped that. I mean, the, the removal of the RIBA pay scales, in 1991, I think, um, has then facilitated lower and lower fees and hence lower and lower salaries. Those two don't always go hand in hand. I know there are issues there, um, but I think that for, for, for everything else that they do that I don't agree with, I think we were bringing back fee scales and bringing back an understanding of what architects should be paid kind of at a cultural level um, for those private clients as we shift away from public sector clients towards private sector clients and that will in effect or should um get to a point where architecture has a much more um exalted is not the word i'm searching for but i honestly have baby brain there's 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 the you know that, that position of um kind of being looked at as a profession that you would want to be a part of i think it can be really a powerful place to work from but it can always be a bit can feel grinding you know there's uh, it's if, if nothing's changing and if, if everything's kind of very static in, in that place. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to kind of um, say, I, I think that the work Charlie's doing and the work that um, Sora doing is, is really amazing in, in helping to keep pushing that stuff forward. Um, and it's certainly one of the conversations Charlie and I have had online previously as, as a practice director. I can't engage in those spaces because it's, they're not for me and I need to not be there. Um, but it, it's it's really delightful to see that they exist and that they are happening and that they're spaces where with anonymity and with uh, with kind of, um, yeah, collective action uh, that there can be change at, at, at that level um, in the profession. On the subject of uh, kind of part ones and, and early career designers finding work. I'd be interested to hear what uh, Beck and Charlie you think about um, the way that uh, hiring happens in the work in the industry and um, ways in which it can become more inclusive or whether you think it's already inclusive or um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, so I mean, um... Again, you know, there's not, um, you know, it's not, it's not a unique thing to architecture. Uh, you, you, you see it a lot across, uh, especially creative industries. Um, one really big thing that hopefully might change in the near future is um, pay transparency. Um, and that's something that has very obvious and immediate benefits. So, you know, you know that the job you're applying for is going to give you a salary that you can live off of. That's a very obvious benefit. But there's also many sort of like wider reaching kind of like almost cascading benefits to this where it means that there's better salary transparency from within organizations. It's It'll massively um, improve problems around like gender pay gaps um more salary transparency is going to make companies far more accountable it's going to ensure that you know groups like chartered practices who have signed up to pay at least a real living wage it's going to hold them more accountable to doing that because they can't hide behind a competitive salary they have to actually put out what they're willing to pay and they have to stay accountable to that so you know, it's not, um, I, I, I won't sort of try and go over, I guess, all hiring in general, but I guess for me, that's one particular area of recruitment that I think we can really zoom in on and really try and get established. Um, and that seems very achievable to me um, because, you know, 
we've seen some job boards from other design industries implement policies where people have to uh, disclose pay. Uh, I believe recently in New York, um, a, a bill was passed or some sort of policy was implemented where there had to be pay transparency um, for work in the city. So it's it does seem to be one of those topics that is kind of you know gradually bubbling to the surface and um there may even be something from us very very soon about this as well um as as a as a little teaser for the next few months <laughs> and, I, and i think that i think that idea that that as you say job the pay transparency is it's a really simple move to make in hiring, but it does have a huge impact. Um, and I was just in um, a REAS meeting last week where I'm a board member and um, the board have now banned anyone not being transparent from advertising through their site, which I think is a really, really simple move. But those sorts of things, if we if we can get Reba to join in on that, if we can get other, um, other job boards to, to join in on that, which again, Charlie should not be a difficult ask, but those those are those are spaces where we can start having and you can start making sure that those um, that we're, we're not promoting working for free. We're not promoting those really damaging practices that that we know exist and, and continue to. I've got one one final question. I think before we move on to the the audience questions and um, bringing bring a couple more people into the discussion. Um, but it, it was it was about the the link between climate justice and and, and hiring and labour and and pay um, and that that inter intersectional crossover um, and I was yeah I was just sort of sort of ask, want, wanted to know uh, your thoughts on that on that on that link uh, and how they all intertwine together and uh, sort of come up with a couple of concluding. Uh, statements for us because I think that would really um, tie tie this discussion together um, in a really nice way. If I sorry, could I just jump onto the back of your uh, question, Vincent? Um, and if you might be able to respond to the poll results as well, because that question is very much in line with um, yeah. Charlie's poll. Are you surprised? Let's see. Um, so don't always know where to start seems to have it in terms of the most common one. I'm very happy that no one thinks they're unrelated. That's good. Um, so in terms of where to start and ways where you can begin to see the connections between labor and climate, I think a really good example um, that I observed recently was um, in the AJ, part of the AJ's Retro First campaign and writing, where um, I believe there was an article by Will Hurst where uh, they'd calculated that the average architect um, has the same uh, produce, is, is responsible for the same amount of carbon emissions as I think it was like six average Americans or something like that. Um, the metric was was an American person. Um, and it, it essentially was just making the point that because of the work that architects do, they are responsible for a great deal of carbon that's emitted into the environment. And I thought the piece was interesting in the way that it acknowledges the role of the profession and the built environment. But I think it was very limited in the fact that it never took um, a moment to ask how much agency does the typical architect have? How much power does this theoretical, uh, you know, imaginary architect have to actually alter the conditions under which they work? And for me, that's where climate and labor come together because the vast majority of architectural workers have little to no say in what work they're doing. And so the only way that you can have a more democratic stay in the work that's being done under the banner of architecture is to organize uh, politically. And one of the most powerful tools you have politically is your role as a worker. So that for me is a great illustration of where those two things come together. Um, and uh, 
there's um, <clears throat> a really good uh, thread on Twitter as well about how this is uh, linked beyond architecture as well, which I'll try and find and I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat. And also in an act of like, you know, shamelessly self-plugging, I also wrote an article about it for ironically the Reaper Journal. Um, which uh, I, I'll, I'll drop into the chat. Um, so that those the, 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 a couple of these links are, I'll, I'll post. I think these are good places to start if you're, you know, seeing these links but you're not quite sure how to engage with it as a as a connection or as a um, as a type of like organizing that can be done in solidarity with climate organizing, for example. Um, yeah, I think I think these things that I'll be sharing are all great places to start. I have literally nothing to add to what Charlie's just said. <laughs> if I may, I'd um, yeah, I'd like to to join in with Charlie's supply of resources and um, ways of yeah enacting. Uh, yeah, the overlaps between inclusion and climate activism in practice, where um, I think that the twin movements can learn so much from each other, whether that's um, inclusivity movements, whether that's gender movement, uh, racial equality, class equality, a disabled and ableism, all of these movements can learn from each other. And especially in the way that um, so many experts have has developed strategies, um, it's essentially towards behavior change in all of these. Um, we're learning about how to change our sort of predisposition for unconscious bias um, and think in new ways. Um, and I'd refer sort of everyone here to the work that Marsha Ramroot was doing as part of the RIBA in her year as a diversity and inclusion um, manager there. And she speaks often of um, a topic called cultural intelligence or CQ for short. And cultural intelligence refers specifically to um, sort of the ability to work effectively in culturally diverse situations. But in response to sort of the climate movement, I'd sort of extend that to also be the ability to work effectively in like a rapidly changing epoch that we're in now. Um, I just think we spoke before about the ability to be flexible. Um, and through sort of searching something like cultural intelligence, like there's so many frameworks that exist, um, which have sort of four pillars of change and they're based off of other people's models as well. Um, and lots of those four pillars of change refer to lots of the things that we've been talking about today, whether that's role modeling, mentorship, um, training and knowledge sharing. Um, I can't remember the other one and developing inclusive processes. So all of these things have been developed with inclusion and diversity in mind, but are very applicable to the conversation of how to develop our practice towards um, sort of sustainable aims. Um, so yeah, so that's one way that I'd add and encourage people to make those direct links and learn from, um, yeah, the vast array of knowledge that exists in different groups. Um, I think we will stop there for now. Uh, I'm just going to pass back to Rachel, uh, who's going to do a quick sum up and then uh, we'll be into a uh, bit of audience particip participation afterwards. Yeah absolutely I will not uh, be on the screen for too long um, because we'll come back to our guests and allow you the opportunity to turn on your cameras, we'll turn off the recording and you can participate in the conversation as well but so far that's been absolutely incredible I mean in terms of a sum up I don't know how well I could do that there's been so much great um, insights there but things that I've written down were there was one point that really got to me which was if architecture is apolitical then we're just working as tools of capitalism which kind of blew my mind from Beth um, so if this is you on baby brain I'm like I don't want to mess with you the rest of the time um, and this idea of collective empowerment and moving towards climate activism 
within that, I think is just really inspirational. I'm just gonna share my screen super quick and tell you about some events that we've got coming up. So hopefully you can see the screen now. Um, the next event in the series on the 10th of June is the AD Masterclass on Understanding Impact. Um, and then the next ACAN conversation will be on the 23rd of June. Um, it's called Transforming Practice, Where to Start. Um, that event will be um, with Diana Dina, Tara Balade and Zafir Amin. And we're going to be specifically talking about how they've engaged their colleagues, how they've resourced sustainability work in teams, how they've embedded protocols in their, to their practices, planned in-house events. So getting down to the nitty gritty of how do you actually start to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you have any questions following today's session, or if you've got any questions for that session, we've got a specific email address that we'll share in the chat with you now. Um, and we'll share the joining links to both of these um, events in the chat as well. So I'm now going to stop sharing and also turn off the recording, um, invite everyone to sort of turn on your video cameras, get involved in the conversation and um, have a bit more of a discussion. So I think we're gonna stop recording now. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>